Good morning. We're going to start off by singing Till the Storm Passes By.
finding that true. Amen. Now let's sing, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.
Thank you, Megan, for that beautiful song. We sure appreciate you and your talent. It's beautifully done. I would like to ask you this morning if you would turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Start, we're going to look starting at verse 13, and I'll have that reference up on the screen for you in a second, but Luke chapter 24. Uh, we're going to talk about Revelation this morning. Uh, I don't mean the book of Revelation. I mean revealing uh, the way in which Jesus reveals himself to people. And what we find in the passage we're going to look at is a well-known encounter of two of Jesus' followers on their way home, which is to the town of Emmaus. They were on the Emmaus Road, the road to Emmaus, where they encountered the risen Savior. This is part three in our Risen Savior series, where we are taking a closer look at uh, most, if not all, of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. And with this particular passage in Luke chapter 24, we're going to take a look at these two gentlemen and, one, and just kind of maybe learn a little bit more about them and, and who they were and that sort of thing. Uh, and so this was kind of a well-known encounter, really. Uh, if you study the scriptures or know the Bible at all, you've heard of the Emmaus Road experience. There's been all sorts of ministries named after it, and it all comes out of the idea of a way in which Jesus will reveal himself to individuals. And so first I just want to point out to you, if you look on the map here that I have on the screen in front of me, uh, you see that red circle, and if you're watching on a cell phone, you might just want to listen for a minute because you're probably going to have a hard time seeing this. But if you're watching from a larger computer screen or your television screen at home, you'll be able to see it without much difficulty. Uh, but that red circle on the map on the screen is the town of Emmaus. And there's a kind of a red squiggly line there that's connecting Jerusalem and Emmaus. And that's just to show the way that these guys might have walked. Now, I've got it kind of as the crow flies. I have no idea what the road actually looked like and how windy it might have been or might not have been. But we do know that it was about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were walking home. And this, in the time frame of this is that these guys had, had, were dealing with the death of their Lord. This, unbeknownst to them, this was actually Resurrection Day. This is the same day uh, that Jesus rose from the grave. And so they, they had not heard an awful lot about this except for from some of, some of the women, but they just couldn't believe that, they, that it could be possible. Uh, they just didn't understand. And so Jesus reveals himself to them personally on the road to Emmaus, but he doesn't tell them that it's him at first and they don't recognize him. It's, it's a strange thing and we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, but he does eventually reveal himself to them, and that really is kind of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but first, uh, let's ask this question just by way of information. I mean, what do we know about these two quote-unquote disciples, uh, these two followers who had an encounter with the risen Lord on the Emmaus Road? I mean, who were they? What do we really know about them? Well, we know that they were not part of the original 12 disciples, uh, we know that in part because one of the two uh, was named Cleopas, and there was no, uh, no, no person in the original 12 disciples with that name. And then immediately following the scripture passage that we're going to look at here, in verse 33 of Luke chapter 24, uh, they went to Jerusalem and found the remaining 12, or sorry, the remaining 11 disciples, 11 now because of the demise of Judas Iscariot. And so we know that if they went to Jerusalem to find the remaining 11, then we, they obviously were not part of the remaining 11. We do, however, know that they were very close followers of Jesus. In verse 13, which is the opening verse in our passage that we're gonna to read together in a few minutes, uh, it starts out like this. It says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. Two of them. Well, who are the them? 
<laughs> you know, two of them. What does that mean? Well, in context, if we look at the verses just before this, we see that it's talking about uh, Peter and John. It's talking about uh, Mary Magdalene and Joanna. And the, the, this is the group of people, including the disciples, who followed Jesus very closely. They seem to go everywhere that, that he went. And these two seem to be part of that. And just to uh, cement that a little further, if you look down, uh, in, in our passage, uh, verse in, in verse 22, they are they are trying to tell Jesus, even though they don't know it's him yet, that all of these things were happening and they just couldn't believe it. And they say, in addition, some of our women amazed us, talking about Mary Magdalene and the ladies who went to the tomb, who came back with the testimony that Jesus' body wasn't there and that he had risen. And so they're saying our women there. And then down in verse uh, 23, I'm sorry, 24, they, they say, then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. They're, they're the only people that they could be talking about there are Peter and John, and they're calling them our companions. And so this was these two guys, these two followers of Jesus, uh, though they might not have been part of the original 12 disciples, they were part of that group that was really close-knit, that just kind of followed Jesus everywhere. They were very apparently committed followers. They were almost certainly present at the Last Supper, as we will see uh, in our passage. But... Let me ask you this question. Uh, the title of the message today is Revelations on the Road to Emmaus. And, and we're going to kind of dovetail that into Revelations on the Road of Our Lives. Uh, God revealing himself. Has Jesus revealed himself to you? Has the risen Lord revealed himself to you? How did he do that? The way in which he reveals himself to two of his followers on the Emmaus Road is absolutely fascinating, but also very instructive. Join with me now in the 24th chapter of Luke, starting at verse 13. If you follow along in your Bibles or follow the verses on the screen. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more... It is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the remarkable portion of scripture. Thank you for this story, Lord. We see 
that you reveal yourself to people in many, many ways. And sometimes, Lord, we may not understand uh, what the future holds or what tomorrow holds. Sometimes, Lord, there are things in our lives that you have withheld from us that we do, that have not yet been revealed to us, Lord. And Lord, I pray that we would understand the importance of the way in which you reveal yourself in our lives. And we thank you and praise you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to jump into the body of the message now. And I first want to point out to you uh, a Jesus who was divinely concealed. This is really fascinating. Uh, first of all, first off, th these guys were on a journey home. Uh, if we cross-reference it to verse 29, which we just read, uh, they were inviting Jesus into their house. And so on this road to Emmaus, they were actually headed home, so they apparently lived there. And they encountered the risen Lord on a long, dusty, and discouraging road home. But also, they were on a journey of understanding. Uh, for whatever reason, they were initially kept from recognizing him. Uh, we're not given the reason why that is. Uh, there are a lot of things that God does that we're not given the reason why. Uh, he's God. Uh, we, we don't always have to know every, everything and every reason why he does the things that he, that he does. But for whatever the reason is, uh, they were initially kept from recognizing him. And this is not the first time that Jesus has withheld things from his followers. So just a couple examples pop into my mind. I remember the healing of, of the blind man, or one of the blind men that Jesus healed. He healed several. Uh, and this particular blind man, he touched his eyes and he asked him what he could see. And maybe you're familiar with the story. And he said, I see people moving around, but they look like trees. And so Jesus touched his eyes again, and then he could see perfectly. And so other times when he healed lame people and blind people, he just touched them or did whatever it was that he did, and they were instantly healed. For some reason, this gentleman took it in two different stages. And so we, we don't know, always know why, but Jesus did that in two different stages. There were times uh, that Jesus withheld details from the disciples because they were not yet ready to absorb it. We see that more than once in the Gospels, that he withheld some truths from them because they were not quite ready yet. That can be frustrating at times. But we clearly do not need to know some things. I know, don't like that, do we? <laughs> Had Jesus immediately revealed himself at the moment that he, that he went up beside these two gentlemen on the Emmaus Road, had he immediately revealed himself, uh, an important journey might have prematurely ended. Uh, there was a process that he needed to take these guys through. Uh, they, they needed to understand that everything that they had experienced and all the things that they were perplexed about were actually part of God's plan from the very beginning. And Jesus needed to take them through the scriptures and explain to them why he had to die and why he would be raised from the dead. You know, God could give us all the information we need to be fully mature believers the moment we get saved. He could, if he wanted to. But there is great value in the process. Growth happens. Uh, we learn to trust. We learn to lean on him. We learn to be dependent upon him. The journey can be almost as important as the destination at times. And remember that God knows how best to reveal himself to us. Uh, he knows how to do that better than we know how to do it. And so... Jesus uh, was divinely concealed, and then next, he was prophetically revealed. Remember, we just mentioned about what these guys needed to know along this journey. A fuller understanding was absolutely crucial here. They needed to understand, again, that this was planned by God since the very beginning. We see Jesus talking about that in verses 25 through 27. The truth of Jesus' resurrection and why it had to happen and why he had to be crucified, this truth need to be absolutely cemented in his followers' minds. And this would be why they later would be willing to lay their lives down for the, for the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
It's incredible that these, if, if the, Jesus had not been raised from the dead, if there was one group of people on this planet that would have known for sure that he had not been raised from the dead, it would have been his followers who saw him die. If they had never seen him again and that had been the end of it, and they just made up some fabricated story about him being raised from the dead, they would not have been willing to lay their lives down for that. When the sword gets put to a person's throat and they know that, that, that what they are refusing to recant on as a lie, uh, suddenly things change rather dramatically. When you Are you willing to die for something that you know to be a lie? You might be willing to die for something that's a lie, but you believe in it. But the disciples would have known if Jesus had not been raised from the dead. They saw him after he had been raised from the dead, and it's so important for them to cement that, and that's part of what was going on here. Jesus was talking to these two followers, and they needed to have this information. They needed to know the whole story about what God had planned from the beginning of time, and Jesus' role in that, and all the events that they couldn't understand were actually part of it. And they, they needed to have that cemented forever, because the time would come when the heat would be on. And he would need them to not give up, but to stand firm. You know, there was a time when Peter and John, just the same day, in fact, I say there was a time when Peter and John were prevented from seeing Jesus for the same reason. According to John 20, verse 9, they did not understand the resurrection from the scriptures, as Jesus was now trying to show these two followers of his, of his on the road to Emmaus, he was trying to show them, to help them to understand the resurrection from the scriptures. The same thing happened with Peter and John. We mentioned the Last Supper and how very likely it's almost certain that these two followers of Jesus would have been there. Uh, I mean, I know when we think of the Last Supper, we think that there was Jesus and only 12 people. And we, unfortunately, we get so much that we believe about the Last Supper from Michelangelo's uh, painting. You know, the one where all of the disciples were lined up facing the painter, or all on one side of the table, all facing the same direction. That, that was realistic, of course. Uh, you, you know, there were a lot more people there, most likely. This was the Passover meal that Jesus had prepared. and. Uh, I would say that a great number of his followers would have been there. And there also would have been more than just bread and wine on the table, by the way. It was a huge feast. It was the Passover. And so here at the Last Supper, we, we find in Luke chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus saying, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. Jesus is trying to clarify. He's coming down to the last moments of his life. And he's wanting the disciples to see that what's about to happen to them is going to be difficult for them to even imagine. They're going to watch him die. Uh, but, but he's trying to tell them that, that this is his purpose that everything is reaching its fulfillment. And then in Matthew 26, verse 24, uh, also Matthew's uh, version here of the Last Supper, it's Jesus, we find Jesus saying this, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. See, God was revealing his plan in his time and in his way. Surely he could be trusted with that. Well, there's an underlying principle here that we dare not miss. God knows the plans that he has for us, and he knows all of our tomorrows. Therefore, we must trust him for the unknown. And lastly, we see that Jesus' identity is unsealed. The full revelation of who Jesus is is now happening in verses 30 and 32. This was a very unusual thing for a guest to do, by the way. Uh, the, the, let's read just uh, 30 here. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. This is not what a guest does. This is what they should have been doing for him. He was the guest. But here as a guest, he took the bread. Uh, it says... And he gave thanks for it, and he broke it, and he began to give it to them. This is very, very unusual behavior. And so, in light of that, you have to know that he had their attention all of a sudden. 
You better believe that they perked up because this was strange and it triggered a memory in them. They remembered the events of just three nights prior to this, the Last Supper. And then they had this summary moment after, after Jesus revealed himself and they knew it was him. And as soon as they recognized him, he disappeared. There's some mystery there to that too. Wonderful mystery. Uh, but he disappeared from among them. But they finally realized who this was and they knew it was Jesus because they were eyes were opened. And they had this summary moment where they said, were not our hearts burning within us? Now, as they reflected back to just a few minutes or maybe a few hours ago, when Jesus was going through all of the scriptures, sharing with them all the things that had to happen to the Son of Man when he came, all of a sudden they realized that that whole time their hearts were just burning within them. Jesus taught them. I'd like to close along these lines. Jesus taught them before he revealed himself to them. There was something that they had to learn on this road to Emmaus. Before Jesus could show himself to them for who he really was, he had to be hidden from them for a time so that he could teach them, so that when he did reveal himself to them, uh, they would be ready for that. Why must we wait until tomorrow to know what tomorrow holds? Why? Don't you want to know what tomorrow holds today? <laughs> I think most of us do. But why must the journey be so dusty? and hard at times. What is God trying to teach us on this journey along the road? We don't know what tomorrow holds. There may be things looming in our future that are intimidating to us. The unknown is the number one cause of fear. We are living in a time right now in our country where there is a lot of fear. Uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, that, that's a pandemic that has, uh, had, that has a grip on our country right now is causing people to be very, very fearful. People don't know what the future holds. They don't understand when this is going to end or how it's even going to end or what it's all going to mean. But even beyond something that's gripping the world, gripping our country, there are things that are gripping our individual lives that we, are, that we don't know what's going to come of it. There are decisions that are, are looming in our hearts and our minds that we have to make. There are people in our lives that we love and care about and we don't know what the future holds for them. Uh, there, there, there are things going on that, that we're perplexed about and we, and we can't see where it's going to end and we can't see uh, what's going to happen. We can't see tomorrow. We don't know how it's going to all pan out. But God has already been and yet he's there now in our tomorrows. And if he is not revealing what we'd like him to reveal, then he's teaching us something. He's teaching us, at the very least, to trust him, to lean on him. I don't know where you are today, I don't know everything that might be going on in your life, but I'm here to tell you and I want to encourage you that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords knows your plight. He knows what's getting you discouraged. He knows what's uh, causing you 
great concern. He, he, he knows the things that you're fearful over. He, he, he knows every little detail about what's going on in your heart and in your mind. And if he's not revealing some things to you that you just wish he would show you, then there can only be one reason for it, and it has to be because he wants to teach you something. Before he reveals it, he wants to teach. Don't miss that. Don't miss what our loving God wants to show us. Won't you join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for being the great God that you are. We thank you for this amazing story and how even today, 2,000 years later, there can be such great application of it in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would help us to realize that even though we do not know what our tomorrows hold, we know that you are the one who holds our tomorrows. And Lord, sometimes we don't always like waiting until tomorrow to know what tomorrow holds. And sometimes the journey that we are on trying to get there can be very difficult and filled with trials and tribulations and all sorts of adversities. But Lord, you are with us every step of the way. You want to teach us, Lord. You want, to, you want to help us to grow. You want to help us to learn to trust you more. I pray, Lord, that whatever we are going through right now as individuals, that we would come out on the other side of that, closer to you than we have ever been. I pray, Lord, that we would lean into you right now with our hearts and that we would trust you fully, knowing that you've got this, Lord. You have got this. You alone, Lord, are qualified to have our 100% complete trust because you alone, Lord, are the only person that has never, ever broken anyone's trust. You are the most trustworthy being that the universe has ever experienced or known. Therefore, today, Lord, we put our full trust in you. We thank you, Lord for teaching us these truths today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. I hope to see you sometime soon along the way in the next couple of weeks. So look forward to this evening's uh, drive through prayer time from 4 to 5 o'clock. If you'd like to come by here at the church, we'll be glad to pray, pray for you. You can stay right in your vehicle, and, and we'll have prayer together. We'd love to see you. Have a great afternoon, and God bless you.